You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. It is a commonly held belief that there are indeed vast areas of the deep ocean that we have yet to truly explore. A seemingly endless expanse thought to house unknown monsters, entities encountered by various different vessels and blurred into sea fables that some struggle to believe. However, unlike sightings and encounters with prehistoric leviathans of the deep, there are indeed other unexplainable phenomena associated with the vast aquatic expanses of our world that are perhaps even more difficult to explain away. Often seen hovering above and diving deep beneath the waves of Earth's oceans and peripheral seas are bizarre, unidentified submersible objects, otherwise known as USOs. Witnessed by the likes of commercial fishing vessel crews, to Navy sonar operators and many others, these USOs have shown up time and time again in places that make us wonder what they are, where they come from, and indeed where they go underwater. Join us on Into the Portal as we dive deep beneath the waves in hot pursuit of unidentified submerged objects and discuss the idea of USO bases hiding in the depths. Hello, everyone. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And welcome back into the portal, your gateway to the bazaar. Yeah, what's up? Welcome back, everybody. What's up, people? We're going extra strange <laughs> this week, I think, eh? I would say so. You think? <laughs> you only think so? I think. I don't know, because we covered a lot of really strange stuff in our last series. That's so. true. It's actually kind of funny, too, because we said, like, okay, guys, the Military encounter series is over, and then... Totally unintentionally, there are some military encounters that come up in this episode as well. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. Yeah, so today we are getting into something a little bit different, maybe. Uh, something we haven't done before, but in a way, I think it's getting back into the roots of ITP. Yeah. We're going to be looking at some, well, the idea of like alien bases around the world. <laughs> Extraterrestrials or perhaps interdimensional beings, who knows, yes. setting up shop on the ocean's floors. One of the least explored realms um, that we have yet to kind of like dive into as a human race. Places that we don't really venture to that often. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, they could be hiding in plain sight just below the surface, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But again, the root of this episode is kind of based in the strange phenomena of witness accounts of USOs. Yes. And by that, we mean unidentified submerged objects. Right. So instead of flying, we're going down into the depths of the ocean and... We're seeing where the UFO, USO phenomena converge, I yes. guess, right? Because yeah. a lot of these cases we're going to be talking about have elements of both. Yes. Um, not absolutely. all of them, but it's, it's interesting because uh, these accounts, like, we covered a little bit of this when we did our Lake Baikal episode, mm-hmm. uh, Strange or Unknown Siberia, I think that one was called. Yes. But it's cool because there's a lot of different theories on what these are, and it's not necessarily extraterrestrial or paranormal even. It could be explained by... In some cases, by, say, um, natural phenomena. In some cases. In some cases. You know, some people don't know what they're looking at. Like, even the Newman Lights as an example could be that. But even though it's not submerged. Right. Uh, I digress. (laughs) And and right off the bat, though, too, even by mentioning Lake Baikal really shows the diversity of what we're going to get into. Because, obviously, Lake Baikal is indeed a lake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And a lot of this is happening over oceans and seas and larger bodies of water. Although, Lake Baikal is 
essentially a, an ocean, right? Like, it, it is so huge. It um, is ginormous. It's, it's like the Great Lakes of Siberia. Yeah. 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 So that in itself is like, yeah, these expansive bodies of water and their connection to these unidentified objects. Right. And so, of course, we're going to be analyzing some encounters for you all. And then we're going to be talking about some potential locations both of the encounters themselves, but then also in conjunction with the idea of a base. Right. And we have a few examples, and uh, they're at specific locations, so we'll get into that for you guys at the end there. But Yeah. There's a lot to touch on, I think. So, so much to touch <laughs> it's on. It's broad. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so fascinating, right? Like, there's so many USO encounters and sightings that don't really get the same treatment, I don't think, as, like, classic UFO. By definition, and the way I think of it is, like, you know, a USO is just more ambiguous because of the fact that it's moving through a substance, you know what I mean? Like, when we see something hovering over, like, a building, it's easy to be like, oh my god, that's not a plane, that looks really weird, that's, like, a UFO. Mm -hmm. But when you see something in the water... It's almost, yeah, like you kind of said, like some of these might have actual terrestrial explanations to them, even though they look so bizarre. But then, of course, mm. we have these extra strange stories where there's objects entering and exiting water that definitely are craft of some kind. There's even abduction stories that we might not get into on this episode, but there's just so, so much more that points to things that's like it's not always a terrestrial explanation no yeah or kind of defies a uh, convention so to speak it's funny that you say that it's it's a uh, material they move through like because right. you know, we never think of air as a as a substance Even but it, it is, is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to think of like that to us because it's so familiar i yeah. guess is the word and so when we see something in our familiar habitat our familiar environments that don't fit what we know Yes. It's like, you know, like it's so much more obvious as a standout versus, yeah. say, some of these other ones where in some ways they're stranger when witnesses do encounter them. But that's what I'm thinking, you know, like. But then at the same time, there's that layer. It's almost like through the looking glass. It's like the subconscious, almost like the metaphysical. You know what I mean? Like where we're yeah. it's that extra layer of foreignness where we and an extra layer of opaqueness like right? literally it's, camoed by mm, the substance itself yeah, you know yeah. what i mean where it's like that weird anyway we we're, we're gonna break all of this down because of course we have a ton of uso sightings to get into and like amber already said off the top what we're really what i really want to dive into pun intended for this episode is the connection with underwater anomalies and possible structures where these things might be going and the goings and comings mm -hmm. are basically originating from, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I was really happy to see this name uh, when I started the research for this because we're kicking things off with a reference to another, none other than uh, who I called the Iceman just because of the, uh, <laughs> the episode we did, but Ivan T. Sanderson, who is a biologist, cryptozoologist we've mentioned many, many times. Mm -hmm. And in 1970, he published a book called Invisible Residence, and I got my hands on this and looked through some sections of it. You know, he's a he, he doesn't just cover cryptozoology cases. This was all about unidentified phenomena. And he focused a section on this dedicated specifically to USOs, what were later called unidentified, unidentified submerged objects or USOs, defined as unknown craft that are sighted in water, obviously, and often sighted rising up out of water or diving into water, according to Sanderson, right? Mm. So he cataloged a whole bunch of these USO encounters. And this is one of the opening paragraphs from his book that speaks to his perspective on this, which I think is really interesting. He says, quote, nearly three quarters of the surface of our planet is covered with water. But despite airplanes now flying over the oceans and boating going on all about, we have only a minute portion of this vast aqueous area under regular surveillance. Mm. That's it. Surveillance, eh? Mm. <laughs> it's very official. He goes on to say, Our shipping lanes across oceans are on, uh, only on average about 20 miles wide, and our airplanes uh, not much more. This is, of course, in the 1970s. But So what really goes on on the world's oceans and even on their peripheral seas is really quite unknown to us. And what goes on under them is even less known, mm -hmm. end quote. So, I mean, he and he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of said that right off the top. I mean, what do you make of that quote? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think he's he's got something to it. And it's it reminds me again of what we were talking about in our third part, encounters our terrors of the deep. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, you know, you can go the cryptozoological route with a lot of stuff under in the world's oceans, but also 
yeah, these USOs, like objects, or are they beings? Are they entities? Ooh. Are they vehicles? Are they something else altogether that we can't <laughs> understand? You know what I mean? Like there's totally. And you know what? It's funny. He building off of that, he convolutes it even more. So oh. he, he, he goes on to say, you know, he mentions like how over 50% of the world's, and this is true. And this is interesting. We've mentioned this before as well. This reminds me uh, even going back to like the Maury Island incident yeah. episode mm-hmm. and what happened over the, the, the water off the coast of Washington in that case. But over 50% of the world's UFO sightings are associated with water. And that's just that's just the way it is. Like either over lakes or oceans or seen entering or exiting water, the vast majority I mean I mean it makes sense, all right? If the vast majority of the planet is covered with water, I guess that's not exactly like a crazy thing to say. No. But the going in and out of it, I think, is the most important part. But this is what I wanted yeah. to mention. He goes on to talk about things like how lakes and rivers as well be are extremely unknown. And for sure, like we mentioned already, Lake Baikal is going to come up in this episode. But he mentions this idea of even unknown monsters in re- remote rivers like Michele and Bembe and how unknown just general water systems are. Oh, Obviously, yeah. this is a bit of an antiquated reference from like the 70s and stuff like that. But he's sort of lumping in this whole idea of like water mysteries into his USO argument. And the reason I want to mention that now is because some of the theories and sort of woo-woo ideas we're going to talk about later... Amber's already mentioned very briefly, I don't know if anyone's noticed it, but the idea of some of these things potentially being like biological in and of themselves, which I find fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. Because there's so many different theories and lines of thought when it comes to these things, if they are, if they are autonomous, if they are, yeah, if they're even if they're man-made, if they're alien technology, Mm -hmm. or if they are some sort of organic sort of entity of some kind. And it's interesting, though, that, yeah, he he makes the the stat there, the 50% of the world's UFO sightings. And I am curious to know if he's like, because if you think about it, especially when you're talking about large bodies of water, you get horizon lines that extend past where the eye can see. So I'm curious if a lot of these are up close sightings, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like how how detailed these sightings are, if they're, you know, especially like I almost picture like the shooting star sight type thing sure. where it's like, you know, it's so far away. Is it actually going under the water? Or is it just submerging below the horizon line for yeah. your line of vision kind of thing? There's that argument. And every single unique case is going to be different, Exactly. Right? And it's actually interesting. Well, I don't even think we made even a big deal about the Valentich story being over water. It just happened mm-hmm. to be. But well, now here again, we are lumping it in, right? As one of those. Great Lakes Triangle series exactly. as well. There's a lot of unexplained phenomena associated with water. Exactly. So, and so that, like I said, it's a rich topic. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And at, at the end of the day, the main point Sanderson was trying to make is just that, you know, we're, we are pretty much completely in the dark because mm-hmm. we can't be everywhere at once. Even with the type of surveillance we have nowadays, like compared to what he was working with in the oh, 1970s, yeah. right? So oh, even yeah. if even if we have, you know, James Cameron that has shimmied his way down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench and his <laughs> own custom little thing, you know, we don't necess- we don't know everything. No. That, that's, that's the point. We don't know everything. And even in the most classified, like, you know, Navy documents and things like programs and stuff like there, we have a few examples coming from the Navy. And it's, it's interesting just to see um, some of their perspectives on that and what radar technology is able to pick up and I know, what they're right? doing with stuff that they do pick up that totally. is, quote, unquote, unexplained. <laughs> mm. And but, Sanderson kicks this off, like yeah. one of the earliest ones he once he gets into is from the 50s and this is it's funny because we like again again going back to maury island we have these really distinct ufo cases and stories that people will remember and then others that definitely happened in the same era that de- fall by the wayside this mm-hmm. first one happened in the 1950s and once again uh, an, an, a poor group of japanese were terrified mm. we keep referencing uh, fishing vessel vessels and military vessels from japan that uh, encounter <laughs> strange things yeah, it seems to be a commonality these days. <laughs> it does. But yeah, we're talking about the Kitsukawa Maru. And this, like you said, Andrew, was in the 70s, or sorry, in the 70s, in the 50s. It was 1957 in April. And this occurred just before noon. And like you said, it was a fishing vessel. And they were en route uh, to Japan. And they were sailing in the Pacific, South Pacific Ocean. Mm. 
Um, so basically what they spotted were two metallic silvery craft that descended from the sky and dove into the water. Yeah. And they had specific coordinates that we pulled up. So that, I, should, I think we should include those in our show notes. Absolutely. Uh, just for anyone that's curious, they want to go look at Google Earth and just see what, what kind of neck of the woods we're dealing with here. And Andrew, I love how you included it here because you knew I was going to ask. Yes. What is a bosun? Because apparently a bosun and four crew members all spotted this together. So we have five witnesses, right? Right. And the bosun is just a petty officer. So he is a, a deckhand essentially on a ship. Sure. But these five individuals spotted these two craft, as they're described, submerging. And... After they submerged, there was some violent turbulence that occurred under the surface. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to me. And yeah. then they completely vanished. So they never re-emerged from the depths. And the men on deck first thought that they were kind of like an aircraft or a classic jet plane of some kind. Yeah. However, there were some inconsistencies. They had no wings. And approximately, they were thought to be about 10 meters in length. So I'm yeah. not sure if there was anything roughly matching that or not. But Maybe. there was no wreckage found. So if this was an aircraft, you would think, especially with a boat in the vicinity witnessing it, you know, because obviously we have examples in this day and age where aircraft completely disappear of course but of course we have witnesses so isn't that interesting just to think that well and it, what's what's cool about this is like it, it's obviously a basic story like that's mm -hmm. basic that's it right but it they it's a <laughs> common theme that they hit and enter the water without impact and then there's turbulence underneath the water so okay. it's not as if it's like a plane crashing that's into the surface of the water you know what mm -hmm. i mean it's either got a certain shape to it that allows it to just like be completely undetected on the surface of the water it's like it's like an arrow going into water is what I'm picturing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which again makes me think about the horizon line idea and the mm -hmm. idea that it's not actually going under the water, but it's like a trick of the eye. Possibly. You know what I mean? Almost like the same when you see those, uh, what's that, a Fata Morgana effect where the ships appear like they're floating? Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like where you can get those sort of weird things and that's just because of different inversions. I think it's like temperature and all that kind of sure. stuff. Sure. And no doubt that's that's going to be a thing. The but time of day is interesting with that's this That's true. We're talking about roughly noon, so it would have had good visibility. Presumably. And the fact that there were... Like you said, there there was turbulence after, so there was some sort of bubbling. So is that like it shift? So I put on your tinfoil hats here, everybody. Actually, that's a line that we're going to get to as a as a little uh, header down there. I didn't even see that. Well, wow, <laughs> serendipitous. But uh, what if that's? Let's pretend for an example for a second that these are craft. Is that like shifting from whatever it's doing for propulsion in the air to how it moves underwater? Like the turbulence mm -hmm. is now like okay, you're moving. That's how it's moving. Mm -hmm. Some sort of propulsion. Like, what else would it be? It reminds me of Aquaman. <laughs> it reminds me Doesn't of it? <laughs> Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea or 20,000 yeah. Leagues Under yeah, the Sea. Yeah, they're cute little flying thing that they, like, have. The flying sub. The flying sub. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what this is. Well, maybe it's just that. We can come back to theories at the end. It's just been the... Uh, the Japanese the, knew it all along. <laughs> yeah, they knew it all along. It wasn't the Nautilus. The Nautilus was from 20,000 Leagues. I can't remember the name of the oh, ship from remember. Voyage. Not Archie. That's from Watchmen. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> the location was something I wanted to touch on again, too. Yeah. Because I, again, we're trying to tie this into the idea of, like, are these coming and going from potential underwater bases? Somewhere specific, or locations? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And after pulling up this location on Google Earth, it appears that it's just east of a massive ridge that's actually a tectonic plate line. Yeah. And this extends, like, north-south. It's roughly, roughly paralleling, like, the Japan Islands. And it extends into the north, and it's known as the Ring of Fire in the north, and mm -hmm. it's an area of a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of uh, earthquake activity because right. of the plates shifting around. But it's interesting because in my mind, if you're thinking about, like, tectonic activity of, of the earth, right? And <laughs> we're going to go to the California coast, too, where we'll see another very prominent tectonic line as well. Sure, yeah. So I'm thinking in my head, like, oh, my goodness, are we going to go down some some uh, potential hollow earth theory kind of thing? Like, are these lines significant? I'd like to. Are they coming and going and submerging? Because we have a very, uh, I don't want to say primitive understanding of, like, the core of our earth, but we don't have all the answers to everything. A lot of it is theoretical. And I'm not saying that's not based off of nothing, but I'm saying this is kind of an interesting thing to oh, me. Yeah. What do you make of that, though? Well, I again, I, I'm glad you uh, had your header here as put on your tinfoil hats, mm -hmm. but I absolutely want to talk about the concept of... I mean, when we say the <laughs> phrase hollow earth, it has a certain connotation to it. It kind of right? does, yeah. But at least some sort of concept of there being 
spaces, some sort of inner spaces or potential, yeah, just 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 gaps Caverns. that we don't know of, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that may or may not be accessible from points that have never been touched by man. Yeah, things are beyond the scale of what we kind of are able to understand. Like I'm talking like, yeah, like almost like clefts and yeah. things like that, and like um, like. I don't even know, but could these aliens be like penetrating into the core of the earth and they like have their, <laughs> their little home base there. And anyways, I, I just thought that was definitely a tinfoil hat kind oh, yeah. of a thing. But even the idea of just getting back to like the ring of fire and, and the zone of like, you know, these shifting plates and even just volcanic eruptions. And mm-hmm. when we talked to, when we went to Hawaii and did that episode on legends of Hawaii and yeah. the idea of like, even there, right, they see these blue balls of fire and they right. seem to be associated with the volcanoes and they explain it in terms of spirituality and the gods and all that kind of thing yeah but could this be something similar right where because obviously there's a lot of volcanic activity occurring underneath the ocean or underneath the ocean surface i should say so again like you know like island building and all that kind of stuff like could this be associated that's interesting i totally forgot about that the the aquilele and the concept Mm -hmm. of them being like entities in and of themselves but then you have ufo communities and ufo watchers in on the hawaiian islands that don't think of them that way mm-hmm. they see them as these the classic sort of like you know an orb in the distance or you you're witnessing ufo activity mm-hmm. so that that's interesting for know. sure yeah i kind of like that one because uh, again yeah this is a very interesting one to, to start off with hey and yeah and i just thought that was another that's something that we should definitely bring up as part of discussion and i th- and i do think to the point of the ring of fire, you know, obviously we're not focusing on just sightings of things happening in that area. But if we did, there's a lot mm-hmm. like throughout island chains and different nations all throughout that region. Mm-hmm. Tons and tons and tons of UFO activity for sure. Exactly. Oh, we have a little house guest. Uh, just so you guys know. If you hear a little here. dingle in the background, a little bell, <laughs> a little jingle bell back there. It's a little uh, spirit cat. <laughs> spirit cat. I'm going to go check on them. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I love this idea that could there be some connection between tectonic activity, volcanic activity, and possible openings that are happening deep beneath the ocean? Like, I think that's what you're kind of getting at, right? Like, these, the tectonic <laughs> activity that's happening is disturbing certain ac- things of the earth that's then allowing for things to to, to move about or to be mm-hmm. seen. I mean, the Akualele is definitely different, the, the fireballs, than yes. sightings that we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. But they do operate in a lot of the same ways. Even if you want to think of it more broadly as like, you know, like a almost like a metaphysical, like a portal kind of a thing, like mm. an area of... Um, like it's kind of like a liminal zone if you want to talk about it like that. Okay. Like, you know, like a... Uh, a, a crossover point like a ley line crossover point of some kind Something perhaps thing like that potentially and it, i think i don't know i'm going really weird with this it's almost like a 3d portal orb that's like the center of our earth and maybe it's just like these weird pockets of energy it's almost like when the sun flares and it goes like and it like sends out a big thing and then i'm just just totally spitballing here, people. It's like the Earth, <laughs> in and of itself, is alive, and these are it's they're the recon vehicles of the the Who sentient knows? inner core. Okay, we've got. Well, gone, we've it's gone even like one. almost like if you want to think of it like, um, oh, what's that like DC universe or like Thor, where they have you know that like the different worlds, and then like they have the crossover points, the portals, right? Sure. So it's like say the portal exists in the center. I don't know. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of different worlds because there seems to be a lot of different phenomena. <laughs> it's like maybe we're just like the most primitive like versions of these very advanced forms that just come and go as they please. Yeah. Now for this next sighting encounter story from the 1960s, we are shifting over away from this from the ring of fire zone, obviously. But this is a really fascinating one and is for me – I mean, kind of not not the crux of the episode, but I I really found this to be fascinating. Again, a reference from Ivan T. Sanderson, and this was an encounter off Puerto Rico in 1963. So many UFO sightings, USO encounters, and just strange phenomena that happen off Puerto Rico, and speculation abounds there, obviously because of the different U.S. military activity that goes on there, like we're about to discuss, but it just being an island and surrounded by water which is what we're talking about today. But Sanderson reports an incident that allegedly took place off the coast of Puerto Rico, 1963, 
And this happened during anti-submarine warfare exercises. So it sounds pretty normal, but Sanderson phrases it as they were essentially training in identifying and tracking underwater craft. So presumably other, like, subs, right? Okay. That's kind of the point, like a radar exercise. Part of this included, you know, things that were really difficult to identify. So it was a possibility that they'd have, like, curveballs thrown at them. They'd be like, what the heck is this, right? But not necessarily thinking to themselves, like, oh, my God, we're witnessing a USO. So these maneuvers were conducted off Puerto Rico in the Atlantic Ocean, roughly 500 miles, like, you know, southeast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And all these reports seem to agree with, as this, you know, with what the story basically said. There's five naval vessels, but... In more than one account, there's also an aircraft involved, and then the the aircraft carrier, the USS Wasp, was the main station command ship for this training operation. And is I guess the Wasp has a pretty like storied history. Uh, didn't really pull it up, but kind of a cool name for an aircraft carrier, I guess. Mm-hmm. So yeah, at least one aircraft involved. We've got the main uh, command ship as the USS Wasp. Everything was going as planned, as far as official records go, up until this point. You had five ships that were traveling in a specific formation for this exercise, when all of a sudden, one of the sonar operators on one of the small vessels radios into the bridge and reports that they'd noticed that one of the five had seemingly broken off formation and had gone in pursuit of an unknown submerged object. Hmm. Just just didn't tell anyone you're just going for it? They're thinking it's part of the exercise. Oh, um, okay. Like, is my, is my best guess, hmm. right? Because they're expecting curveballs. But the commanding officers weren't expecting this. So this would have been normal if this was part of the planned operation because, like I said, decoys were often employed. They were doing... They wanted them to be thinking on their feet. However, this time, whatever seemed to be drawing one of these five ships away couldn't, couldn't have been a decoy. Uh, According to multiple sources, the official report was that there was a USO traveling over 150 knots underwater. Hmm. So that's very fast for anyone. So knots is obviously like the speed used for ship speed. Um, I don't have the exact conversion here, but just as a reference point, like most subs wouldn't be going more than I would guess 50. Like that would be fast, like very, Mm -hmm. very fast, like modern submarines, like nuclear subs, like ripping. Yeah, like that's equivalent to 277.8 kilometers an hour. Kilometers, mind you. So that's miles, very fast, though. Miles would be closer to 172 miles. That's 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 fast. Right. <laughs> that's really fast. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the the commanders that are stationed on the USS Wasp are kind of pissed at this point. They're like, this is clearly not a part of their exercise, and now they're concerned because this mm-hmm. is something they don't – they have no idea what's going on. The main command station that's on the aircraft carrier, the USS Wasp, they began fielding in like the same reports from these other vessels in in this exercise and completely confused. At first thought there was something like messing with their exercise. I imagine they might have been thinking even possibly like a foreign entity, like a Russian sub or something, like spying on them or something. But that's way too fast. That's the problem. Hmm. Um, But these reports kept coming in from the different vessels involved. So 13 separate craft from subs to airplanes and ships had this object on their radar or sonar at some point during this exercise. The size of the object or craft or whatever we're believing this to be was very difficult to tell, difficult to ascertain. But either way, it was... Strange enough that it was reported in official naval naval records that were accessed uh, in Virginia. I guess that's where one of the Hmm. main naval offices was. Mm -hmm. So what the hell? What the hell's going on here? It's very, very strange. Well, Uh, I know, hey? Like, that's interesting. And the fact that there is multiple vessels, again, so we have multiple witnesses. And it is actually documented on their... Uh, official records which is interesting so this was this was published in sanderson's book as well or was this a different oh this was published in sanderson's book he claimed to go to washington and try to get explanations from different politicians who had made comments about similar incidents and stuff like that Mm -hmm. he was really pushing for disclosure back in the day uh, Hmm. in in the in the 60s 70s and, uh, but the story didn't even end there. The Navy actually continued to monitor this object for four days as it was kind of like coming and going from the same oh. area. And it recorded that it descended to depths of over 27,000 feet. I don't know how they were able to exactly wow. pinpoint that. There, but it's complicated. I was looking into this for another story we have coming up. And it's it's very, there is a very specific yeah. science about how you 
do all that. It's very complicated. So I very much admire anyone that's I know, right? That well, <laughs> anybody listening that is uh, in the Navy, hit us up or, yeah, or does radar, yeah. sonar. That, that'd be pretty cool. Oh, definitely. But they couldn't pinpoint what the hell they were trying to observe. Like despite four days of, of acknowledging something moving quickly and descending to those depths, mm-hmm. they, couldn't, they couldn't pinpoint what it was. So was this a reconnaissance vehicle spying on military exercises? Mm. Is like moving that quickly? It's not a biological entity that I can conceive of, extraterrestrial no, you, or otherwise. Yeah, or right? some sort of yeah, exactly right. I yeah, it's hard to speculate on what it could have been. Right. I will say this though, <laughs> I'm pushing for this for this on this episode because there seems to be parallel because puerto rico is actually located really close to another tectonic plate line right so it's interesting it actually wraps around it's almost like a circular it's a tiny plate Mm -hmm. and it also actually intersects the bermuda triangle so Hmm. i'm not saying that puerto rico intersects the bermuda triangle but this this um, tectonic section yeah Yeah, exactly sure isn't that interesting that is so that's a bit of a connection there and i I just had to double check just to be sure on a couple of maps but it is very close Okay. So again, that's another thing. But I'm not. I'm not saying this is definitive. Obviously, I'm just like this is a weird thing, a, an interesting observation. Yeah. Let's put it that no way. doubt. <laughs> I had to throw this in here just because we've mentioned Puerto Rico on, on a few other episodes before, and it's tons of UFO sightings, not just USO sightings. And of course, we covered the chupacabra as, mm-hmm. as a potential extraterrestrial entity. And if there's all these USO, if there's all this USO activity happening around this area as well. Maybe it was dropped off from something coming from below rather than from up top, if you're <laughs> of the mind of that theory when it comes to the, <laughs> right? Because it's like, that's a strange thing happening in Puerto Rico that some people believe is associated with UFOs. So I had to just chuck that in. Maybe El Chupa has got uh, some gills on him. Maybe he's uh, maybe he's uh, coming up from the depths. And that's why he's sucking everyone dry. He needs that's to stay moisturized. <laughs> that's why he's sucking everyone dry. <laughs> he needs the moisture. Moisture. <laughs> oh, man. I did have... A corroborating account that is recent that I did want to briefly me- oh, yeah. briefly mention because mm-hmm. obviously really, really strange uh, 1963 military sighting. And then we also have a 2013 uh, account where it was a, a thermal image of an object splitting into two and then descending into the ocean off Puerto Rico as well. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into this in crazy detail. I do have it in front of me, and it's super detailed. So maybe we'll cover it on Patreon as a solo Interesting. incident. Interesting, yeah, dive into but that. But just as something to kind of corroborate this, where we now have <laughs> not just the subs witnessing it, but objects traveling over 109.7 miles per hour, uh, as documented by the frame-by-frame camera uh, that captured it, split into two objects and descended into the water. And its presence actually ended up... Um, shutting down airspace briefly and uh, air traffic control for just regular flight takeoff and stuff like that. So it was an official documented account. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's... It's weird, man. It's it's just bizarre. Where are they going and... and, and Splitting into two, yeah. Yeah, and and that's the other thing, too. It's like, what what splits into two and why? I know. It's like it reminds me of something you'd see under a microscope. And that's, again, makes me think of something that's biological, something that's just able to, like, like bifurcate itself at will and reamalgamate. If you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. we saw examples of that in the Charlie Red Star case that we covered like a few years ago. Right. And and now I think Rob actually over on Our Strange Skies has re-released our discussion on his Patreon feed, which is yeah. really cool. So if you guys haven't checked that out, Our Strange Skies podcast is yeah. amazing and he's doing a whole revamp <laughs> love that yeah totally so so stoked i was so sad when he brought down his feed yeah it's a lot of weird stuff happening so here we have essentially what we've talked about so far are just are just objects right like associated See, with they're water ambiguous at best yeah <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean like the silvery craft that's the like best description we've gotten and that was from the very first case, the Japanese example. Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, let's get into a couple more here. And these are a little bit more casual, but I think that they're, they add to, to the discussion here. Okay. And the first one was actually, so this was actually in the 2000s, 2007, if I'm not mistaken here, February. And it was actually cited by a woman who was on a cruise ship at the time. It was called the Dawn Princess cruise ship. And she had her sighting at about 2.15 a.m. I know what you guys are thinking, 2.15 a.m., what are you doing up? Are you... Obviously, you've been partying the night away. No, apparently she was coughing up a storm. (laughs) So this reminds me of a classic, like, (laughs) 
<laughs> snowbird that's like going for their cruise. Yeah, and, totally. You know what I mean? So basically this woman was returning to San Francisco from a cruise along the Mexican Riviera. They were just off the Californian coast, traveling at a speed of about 20 to 22 knots. So she describes it as a fast speed. So that's interesting, right? Just for comparison to the last example. Yeah. And uh, they had just reached, uh, were just approaching the Golden Gate Bridge. So she says at about 2 a.m., she found herself coughing up a storm, and she asked her husband to go get her some hot lemonade. <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So she says here, I was awake anyway, so I pulled back the curtains and stood in the window to watch the ship's turning water. Mesmerizing. After about five minutes, three softly glowing objects came into view. Three uniform, neatly spherical objects, evenly spaced in a line parallel to the ship's hull and hovering just a few feet above the surface of the water. Based on the appearance of dolphins from the window and of the people seen standing on piers, I'd say that these spheres were somewhat larger, maybe about 12 to 15 feet high, hmm. perfectly smooth with a pale bluish-white glow. And they appeared to stay in one place while the ship moved past them. They were hovering, but didn't disturb the water below them. Just as they went out of my sight, the left one towards the bow of the ship splashed down into the water and disappeared. Mm -hmm. And then she goes on to say, Of course, I hadn't thought of tearing myself away from the window to get a cell phone or a camera, both of which were in the safe. And then she says, There were three more glowing spheres that hovered, two minutes later so they came back just past her window it's weird and Bizarre. then she had another one about four to five minutes after that where two more were seen but they were farther away so it's interesting because she says here the first and second groups had been located just where the ship's wake uh, or the phone line ends mm -hmm. so they're pretty close but then the last group was about twice as far away so she was just, like, amazed. And then they um, they basically just dropped down into the water and disappeared. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then her husband came back, and unfortunately they didn't reappear. So she was the only witness to this. Okay. Okay. So, again, single witness. But I thought that was interesting, hey? Bluish spheres. Yeah, and again, that sort of is like mm -hmm. the, the the balls in Hawaii, the aquale, like mm -hmm. fireballs, similar mm -hmm. sounding. It's, to me, this orb-like, you orb -like, know? Orb-like. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, descending into the water. It's so funny. It's like, it's if for people who think that these are, say, whether you think it's a craft or, or some sort of just entity on its own or, or whatever, it's almost like if they're going somewhere into the water, we've already talked about a few different descriptions, like the, uh, the Kitsukawa Maru with the wingless silver objects. We've got eight bluish spheres that's like, you know, multiples that's so different. And then mm -hmm. the, the strange ones underwater with, in the Puerto Rico, it's almost just like they're different makes and models of uh, of uh, of of these types of craft that are underwater that we don't recognize you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like the, it's like it's like a Oh, here comes like a Dodge Ram coming into the lake. Oh, there's a, you know, there's a, there's, you know, there's a Crosley over there. There's exactly. a really old version of some, you right? They're all oh. completely different. And are they manned? Are some of them manned? Are some of them entities? Are these like, you know, are these uh, galactic beings that are interacting, like different races from di totally different areas and they converge and they go their separate ways? Because why are they all completely different? I mean, this would be so, it would be also interesting if mm -hmm. like people were seeing, it was like just the same silver disc or silver ball yeah. or whatever everyone's seen it yeah you know what i mean mm -hmm. which isn't well, really the case what do you think? is it swamp gas <laughs> swamp gas off uh, of the we dawn can get into princess in a bit here we got another awesome one from laguna beach <laughs> yeah i thought that was just a classic uh reminds me of the old reality show <laughs> oh yeah um i wonder if any of that cast ever saw a ufo off uh, the coast of laguna <laughs> They probably would have been too self-absorbed to notice it, probably. would be my best guess. <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. It's again from the, the 1960s, but wasn't reported until a little bit later. But it was roughly June, according to this account. We don't actually have a name. It lasted about several minutes, and this was, yeah, again, Laguna Beach, California. Mm -hmm. We have a best man who was doing, doing his duty. He was uh, prepping a bridal suite. Uh, for later that evening, allegedly. <laughs> and he claimed that he finished and went for a walk on the beach. And uh, a, a long wooden staircase was close by that led down to the cliffs uh, to the beach. And the waves appeared to be uh, in the cliff shadows from, like, the highway coming along, that the headlights coming from the, the highway. 
and he claimed that he saw a series of lights glowing from behind the waves, about five feet apart, eight, about five feet, eight inches in diameter. It slash they, as he describes, gave the appearance of almost like portholes on the side of a submarine or some, some kind of submersible. And he's standing there with no explanation at all. Hmm. Just absolutely bizarre. And then later on, they interviewed a California lighthouse keeper on the radio and uh, was asked about this. And he claimed to have seen the same thing. He was like, in all your years of watching the surf, had you ever seen anything particularly strange? And he described this exact same strange hmm. porthole-like effect of some kind of a vessel like that clearly wasn't like a, 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 a regular submarine or a boat, I guess. That I mean, what do you weird. make of that? Okay, so just like let's go through this again. So basically he's saying that the waves in which he saw these things were in the shadow of a cliff. So they couldn't – he's saying it couldn't have been car lights yeah. essentially. Yeah. Okay, yes. so that's what that essentially means. Right. That's interesting though. So a series of lights glowing from behind the waves – So behind, like, you know, waves are obviously, they do have a verticality to them. So it's almost as if when they're cresting is kind of what I'm picturing. He's seeing all, like, almost like, you know, in the Meg when there's that that one scene where the huge wave comes into the surf and then they see Mm. the shark swimming in the wave, like, behind. Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. And it's, like, just in the actual crest of the wave. You can see them. Totally. (laughs) I'm I'm picturing something like that where it's, like, being exposed by the lapping waves. Right. I don't know, though. What do you make of that? Well, to me, it almost sounds almost like some kind of a, yeah, like an alien submarine. It it sounds like he's describing the Nautilus from from, Mm -hmm. uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, where it's got this sort of like fish shape with the portholes on the side and kind of like just like a weird appearance. But obviously in that, right, Mm -hmm. obviously in that story, fictitious film and book and whatever, it's it's still a man-made submarine, obviously. True. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to think too that this witness, he... Like he says in the account, the other witness, supposedly the the lighthouse keeper, wasn't aware of his sighting. Right. He just was talking on the radio about this one day, and then this individual happened to overhear it. Yeah, same which thing. I think prompted him to go to the actual uh, uh, National UFO Reporting Center, which is where we're pulling all of these from. Right. Because, like you said, there was quite a, a gap. There was about three decades. He actually saw in 1963, didn't report until 97. So that, again, I feel like that's one of those prompt... Like, again, it almost reminds me of the Terrors of the Deep, right? Where the captain, like, you know, it's like decades later, he comes out with his story kind of thing. Yeah, so exactly. You have to just, like, you know give people the benefit of the doubt, I think, when it comes to that kind of thing with time gaps and stuff. And, I agree. And look at their motives. I think that's important. Do you have any other co- like comments or thoughts on that I one? I mean, I don't know. It's so short. I wish mm-hmm. I wish there was a, more a, detail. A, an image or something or just more detail or, or something. Or something emerging from the depths. Or, or even in some other reports that we saw that we didn't actually include as specific ones is like the hovering over. Mm. There's, uh, yeah, fewer. It seems as if there's like an interaction between a UFO and a USO as if right. they're like you know kind of Ooh, like okay a duo or something <laughs> okay <But laughs> we have another a little bit more of a meat on the bone i'll say for this next one all right so for this next case we're going to be touching on some very mysterious quote-unquote unknown radar alarms that went off on a navy submarine mm. Do you feel as though there are things in your life holding you back or that you could benefit from talking things out with a licensed professional counselor? BetterHelp.com is making it easier than ever to get on track with your mental health and connect with affordable therapists online from the convenience of your phone or laptop. BetterHelp.com is safe and private, allowing you to get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist, BetterHelp.com is available on multiple platforms and across the globe, so you have the help you need wherever you find yourself. They make it easy to assess your individual needs and match you with a licensed counselor wherever you are in the world. Just check out the testimonials posted daily on their site by people just like you. You can get started right away 
and begin communicating with a specialized counselor within 24 hours of signing up. This isn't your dog or your best friend. This is a licensed professional that will communicate with you via weekly scheduled video or phone sessions. And BetterHelp.com allows you to send a message anytime you need to with timely and helpful responses in return. BetterHelp.com offers a secure, convenient way to access affordable online therapists from the comfort of your living room, office, or wherever you find yourself these days. Financial aid is available for those who qualify. So please, if you feel like you could benefit from this, check it out at betterhelp.com. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com. And use discount code PORTAL, spelled P-O-R-T-A-L, to get 10% off your first month. Start living your best life and take charge of your mental health along with over 1 million other people. Again, that's betterhelp.com. Dot com with discount code portal. So this actually comes from um, a 2017 account from a man named Mark D'Antonio. And he is a partner in uh, what's called an FX Models. And it's a company that actually makes submarine models. Not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not a modeling agency. <laughs> no, which kinda, I actually thought it was. It kind of sounds like that for <laughs> it sure. It does. <laughs> FX Models. Yeah. You know? But it does make sense. But he's also cited as an astronomer and a UFO researcher who is associated with MUFON and also has contracts with the Navy through that modeling company. Okay. So kind of an interesting individual. And he provided a firsthand account of something very spooky that happened during his time in the depths as a <clears throat> alleged guest aboard a Navy submarine. Mm. Okay. So D'Antonio's story begins as such, and this is a direct quote from him. As a thank you for doing some work for them, the Navy, the Navy asked me if I wanted to go for a ride in a submarine. So I said yes. The phrasing right <laughs> off the bat. I'm sorry. I just have so much problems I know. It's the, like if that was fra- – like, okay, we'll, we'll break it down we'll after. We'll break it down, but – but I just want to say that sounds very suspicious <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah, because it sounds like a six-year-old. <laughs> yes, that. And it's like my first question is, does the Navy ever ask anyone for a ride <laughs> in a submarine? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, this is does this happen? Okay. And my first thought was no. But, okay, this was taken from an article. And, again, we're just direct quoting from him. So he says here, he was sitting, I was sitting there zoning out a little. This is in the submarine. Because I was a little seasick, and all of the sudden, the sonar kid shouts, fast mover, fast mover, and I'm jolted awake, thinking, what's happening? Is it a torpedo? The executive officer comes out, and the operator shows him the path of the object, and the officer says, how fast is that going? And the kid said, several hundred knots. (laughs) Hmm. So he goes on to say... That he leaned in to listen, and the officer asked this this guy to confirm it. So he basically confirmed it was not a machine anomaly from the sonar itself, and that it was actually something that they were picking up. Um, so basically, the sonar guy asked his officer what he should do with this. And, quote, the officer said, log it and dog it. <laughs> in other words, log it and bury it. Isn't that weird? Hmm. Anyways, that's my that's me quoting. Okay. okay. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> but isn't that interesting how he calls it a fast mover? Yeah. So that is something that comes into the, the story, I should say, a little bit later on, because this D'Antonio fellow actually claims hmm, to have done some like, you know, probing around as to what this thing was. And he supposedly asked one of this like senior navy navy officers or something that he was working with several years later what is the fast mover program so he's basically like trying to probe into some sort of conspiracy or yeah. secret program yeah and then supposedly this dude said sorry mark i can't talk about that program <laughs> so basically d'antonio took that as confirmation that the program exists and said everything without saying anything is basically what he was trying to argue. So, okay, this was all reported at a conference for UFO enthusiasts that uh, occurred 
actually at the site of the Close Encounters of the Third Kind rock. You remember the, oh, the, really? the finale? Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. guess they meet there every year. <laughs> but it's interesting, yeah, because he was, uh, he basically, I yeah, was talking about his findings there and then that particular incident. So is there any weight to it, right? Can can this kind of like hold its own with other radar analysts or sonar analysts or whatever? Yeah. What I do mean, you make of the, the knots, the seven several hundred knots? I mean, that's even faster than what we referenced earlier, obviously. Absurdly fast. It's that's Absurd. like thou- that's like that's like thousands of kilometers if it's like here, seven hundred plus potentially. Yes. I mean, it, so, that's so fast. It's very fast. I obviously had no reference point, so I was like, okay, what the hell kind of rate does a torpedo go at? Sure. You know what I mean? So apparently the fastest known uh, torpedo, it's the Russian VA-111 Cheval Super Captiv- Captivating? Cavitating? Torpedo. I guess. And that goes a top speed of about 220 knots. By so comparison. less than half. So an incredible rate of speed, so far beyond the capabilities of our known underwater technologies, I would argue. So basically, this article went on, and this was from The Drive, and we can include this in our notes here, but they went on to probe this because they had some issue with the same things that we kind of had issue with, right? Like, this seems kind of far-fetched. And so they actually got a retired submariner, um, his name is (laughs) Aaron Amick, and he went on to say that he was actually um, in, in the Navy as well. But he said that the Navy doesn't actually have a way to classify these strange sounds. So he said that he confirmed that these do pop up every so often. Right. And they are moving at incredible speeds, like comparable to what this guy described. Yeah. But it's very rare and it's very inconclusive. And so the Navy, like he goes on to say, doesn't have a way to classify them. Right. Um, but he goes on to say that they were instructed that nothing is ever unknown. So if they do have to log it, they log it as something seismic or biologic. Yeah. So unknown, but something within those categories, right? So So they're not allowed to mark it down as a as an alien craft. I mean, even if you're saying even that in itself is a, a presumption, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. But could this originate from above? Like, is this even underwater? Like, you know what I mean? Like, right, yeah. And that was asked. And uh, supposedly, they said it, it would have made it more plausible, but it wouldn't have been a mystery to them then, right? Because they would have been able to identify it. And then he also goes on to say that they were aware of very high-speed targets on sonar that are never explained, but they have no idea where that information goes or where it didn't go. Yeah. <laughs> so is it yeah. ever followed up on? You know what I mean? So it right. seems to be like a mystery. It's almost like a black hole where this information is just stored. <laughs> which is typical, which we've mentioned many a time on in different cases and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This fellow, though, he said that the biggest takeaway is that there are these mysterious sounds. They are emanating from the depths. And they are heard by these talented sonar operators. Yeah. But the Navy, he says, here's a quote, the Navy seems to have made it all but impossible to identify these events for further review as sonar operators are not allowed to, quote, not know what something is. Which hmm. is weird, right? Isn't that strange? Yeah, that is super, super it's strange. It's like you're not allowed to not know, so you just, like, assign something just to assign something. Just... You know, like, that just seems weird. So in my head, I'm, like, going full conspiracy here. Like, you know, like, they have, like, a secret log file where it's, like, it's totally classified, totally under wraps. It's, like, CIA, like, only kind of, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) If you see this, you're dead kind of thing. And I wonder if that's because (laughs) there is obviously a group that might know something Mm -hmm. and they don't want it to get maybe there's obviously going tinfoil hat woo woo conspiracy like they're communicating with a group that may or may not be located at a certain spot Mm -hmm. don't want anyone else to know Mm -hmm. it's the same concept of some sort of diplomacy secret diplomacy something along those lines or it's just highly classified technologies that no one's allowed to know about yet right that let's is go back. Human. <laughs> let's go back to the guy, like just getting a ride on the submarine, like just to speculate on that a little bit, because you and I talked about mm-hmm. that off air, like for a while. And uh, you know, if you're a contractor yeah. for something, I I don't see it out of the realm of possibility that you get to go on one. Mm-hmm. Do you get to go on it while it's submerged and out and about? That's another question, right? True. The only the, the only the only two people I can think of that would ever get something to have something like that happen that are not like in 
the in the military, military are some sort of a high level contractor, like mm-hmm. from like Halliburton type thing, like yeah. a weapons contractor or something along those lines, Private or a high ranking diplomat yeah. that has a personal interest in like buying equipment or has or there's military ties there of some kind Mm -hmm. you know you know what i'm saying yeah like in all fairness to d'antonio and to his position in his company like it's kind of ambiguous right because he is a ufo enthusiast so that kind of (laughs) muddies the waters but his company does make these incredibly detailed uh, miniatures right these models of exactly that of of navy submarines and so To get that amount of detail, obviously, you have to be on the vessel itself. So in my mind, it's like, is this a figment of his imagination that he kind of dreamed up? Is this something that perhaps happened and he's exaggerating it? You know what I mean? Or did this all happen just the way that he said? Mm, (laughs) I don't know. We'll never know, right? But (laughs) I thought that was a very interesting sort of thing. And again, we're going down a little bit of the military route, but... Not too far. <laughs> just a little bit. Just, just, just a little bit. Just a wee you bit. did have another case here, mm-hmm. though, that I was pretty excited about talking about. This is really spooky. And, yeah, this is, again, has a lot of weird connections to UFO phenomena as mm-hmm. well. And uh, it's actually two incidents, as reported by Popular Mechanics. And in the first, uh, this was a quote here, the pilot saw a dark mass underwater as he and his team retrieved a flying practice drone. Okay. So the pilot described the object as a big mass, kind of circular, and he was certain it wasn't a submarine. So he's certain about that. In the second sighting, a practice torpedo that the pilot was sent to recover was, quote, sucked down into the depths of the ocean. And this was in the presence of a similar underwater object. The torpedo was never recovered. It was never seen again. Hmm. Uh, This one was very interesting. It came from the 90s, actually, um, and it was (laughs) reported by... This is kind of an interesting... So it's a a line to the infamous tic-tac-toe UFO. (laughs) Tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac UFO. (laughs) Tic-tac-toe UFO. That just sounds good. Tic-tac-toe UFO. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it was the tic-tac-toe UFO. (laughs) Fashion City (laughs) Outlet (laughs) Mall. Okay. um, But yeah, no, this actually was... Information that was forwarded to um, a guy named Commander Fraver, who was the witness of the infamous Tic Tac UFO. And that was the 2004 Navy footage that was released back in 2017. Yeah, that's right. And uh, people will be very familiar with that. If you Google that quickly, you'll be like, oh, yeah. Totally. So Fraver was actually a guest on the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. And he went into detail about his own sighting in 2004, as well as this additional information that was brought to him by this Navy pilot, right. the, the helicopter pilot that had his own experiences back in the 90s. Yeah. So according to Fraver, quote, the hello drops a swimmer in the water. He hooks the whole thing up and they fly back. The first time they were out and they were going to pick up a BQM. He's sitting in the front in the CH-53. You can see down by your feet. And as he's looking down, they're 50 feet or 15 meters above the water. He sees a kind of dark mass coming up from the depths. The pilot was at a loss as to how to explain this. He swears that the torpedo was sucked down and not sunken. So that's interesting, hey? Yeah, like, yeah. at first, I kind of was a little bit hesitant. I was like, maybe he's just seeing the shadow of his own helicopter. You know what I mean? Like a dark mass that gets bigger as you get closer, you know? Like, because obviously the shadow would get bigger the closer you are to the surface. But again, that's kind of, that's almost like a Joe Nickel and an owl. It, kind it, of that's exactly what that you is. Know? Because obviously that... Yeah, it's one of those things, right? It's like, sure, that would technically look like something getting larger, the shadow getting bigger as you go closer, Mm -hmm. but it's distinctly different than something actually physically in the water coming up. And I'm picturing this in my head as being like, almost like it would look like, uh, you know, like Pinocchio and the whale, like there's a whale Mm -hmm. coming up from underneath you, but clearly the shape and the general sense of what it was is like this wasn't that obviously al- also a whale would not be uh, surfacing directly underneath a helicopter no, and it would suck down something nor would it do that and also a summer a navy sub wouldn't be doing this either they would be have communications between yeah. the two vehicles yeah. right exactly yeah interesting right because there was two different it was kind of crazy actually i didn't do the full full quote here but in the first 
or sorry, in the second instance. Um, so basically what happens, like we described, so basically a, um, a swimmer is dropped. So there's someone that has to exit the helicopter, is dropped down on a line to hook up the torpedo, mm-hmm. and then they pull the whole thing up and then fly away. Yeah. Uh, so basically what happened was in the second instance, the, after the first one where he just sees the dark mass, the helicopter pilot had dropped the swimmer, so he's on his way descending down when he sees it. He freaked out, and he starts yelling over the intercom, like their like, communications, yep. to get the hell back up. So they actually pulled him back up just in time to see the torpedo get sucked down below. So he could have got sucked. So he could have potentially in this story, Ooh, which is really down to the depths. spooky, man. That's spooky for it's sure. really creepy. But this story gets even more interesting and a little more convoluted because this guy, Commander David Fravor, who witnessed the infamous Tic Tac UFO, the only reason he says he saw this Tic Tac UFO was because it was hovering above a mysterious larger object that was under the water. Yeah. So that to me is like, what the heck? This is where things are all starting to tie together here, right? Yeah. Because go watch the Tic Tac UFO video, everyone, if you haven't, like, if you can't remember it, I think most of us it looks listening like a have tic-tac. seen it. Reminds me of the first account we covered, right? right? The Japanese. Very basic shape. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, no portholes on it, right? It doesn't look like a, like a classic saucer craft no. or anything like that. It does very much remind me of, again, multiple things we've referenced so far here. The Akualele and having like multiples. And then we had the woman's account from the cruise ship where you mm-hmm. have these eight very similar Spears. sort of shaped objects. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the Puerto Rican 2013 account where you have an object splitting into two and descending into the water. Again, like wingless mm-hmm. object of some kind. Oh my gosh, and yeah. when I'm th- picturing something splitting into two, unless that's like a biological thing, you had a weird comparison. You're like, it's almost like a cell. It's like cellular yeah, division. It's like biology, right? Weird, right? So but on like a the macro scale, obviously. Mm-hmm. But if it's not that and it is a craft, then that's some pretty, pretty cool. Like, you know, it's like they, they dislodge and there's like mm-hmm. two completely separate craft. That go That's off pretty and do neat their own to thing. think. Like, you know, like obviously scale is relevant. So we think of cells as being microscopic in size, but we could be microscopic in size to another race that's so much bigger. Mm. And that is literally what they're doing. Yeah, it's the, yeah. the multiplication of cells that we're witnessing. Because that <laughs> reminds me of even a story that we covered along with the Double Density Boys, I believe, yeah. when we did Creepy Canada and we talked about some UFO stuff and there was a witness that saw something coming towards him under the surface of a lake and then he threw a rock into the water and it split into, I think, four or five different Yeah, I'm trying and to then what that it was. all kind of went away. I think that might have even been Charlie. No, it wasn't Charlie Red Star. No, it it was something, I think, over in central eastern Canada. Gotcha. But that, uh, we'd have to go back and re-listen to that one. That was such a fun episode. I miss those guys. Yeah, if you haven't, go back and check that out, everybody. That was Mm -hmm. an earlier one that we did with the Double Density guys. Mm -hmm. But again, right, these bifurcations, these multiplications, splitting, and then reforming, it's very, yeah, it's very uh, cellular seeming, but... Again. The, the one reported by Fravor here, though, you said it, it says here, so like the roughly about the size of a Boeing 737. It's large. Large. Mm-hmm. So it almost reminds me of like a mother craft. Right. And then they have these smaller crafts kind of coming and going. Yeah. So are we dealing with something that is on the move in the oceans? Are we dealing with something perhaps that is a permanent base or multiple permanent bases around? Right. If, if any of this at all, yeah. <laughs> if you want to believe any of this. <laughs> That's probably a good segue to dive into some of our theories and discussion, I would say, yeah. if you're ready for that. I think so, yeah. So obviously, like much of what we've discussed here, I feel like we're maybe even setting us up for, I'm not going to say it definitively, but some sort of a, a follow-up because we're talking about the vehicles for the most part here. Mm-hmm. But the idea that, like Amber just said, associated with them is like, where the hell are they going and where are they, where are they coming from? And are they associated with some sort of underwater location specific location a base if you will i'm air (laughs) quoting here and like we've talked about i mean underwater is a pretty good place to hide from humans obviously with the exception of david cameron scooty booting around with his billions of dollars Mm. at the butt right i mean like it's a pretty good place to hide i mean we don't we're not we're not down there everywhere all the time no and yeah like one of the questions we've discussed is whether or not these usos coming from some kind of base did it actually originate down there, I'm talking something along the lines of the abyss or perhaps something along the lines of hollow earth, like Amber mm. has alluded to, or are the bases placed there by some sort of 
extraterrestrial from some sort of a distant place, whether interdimensional or otherwise, and have sort of set up shop in a spot that just makes sense because no human would naturally come across it. Mm -hmm. Sanderson makes this sort of interesting reference that dates him dates himself very much so but he mentions this idea of like nasa having their astronauts obviously when they return to earth they're always crashing down into water when they Mm -hmm. return make and he's sort of making this argument that perhaps there's some sort of reason for it one it's easy to hide and two if these are actual craft moving at high speeds maybe it just makes sense as far as being able to come and go that they're getting a little softer impact when they're entering the atmosphere and then entering oceans Hmm. I, I, I guess it could it couldn't hurt I guess but if you've got the technology to hide from us I mean and you're going 700 knots underwater maybe <laughs> you're not super concerned about the the landing that is interesting uh, but yeah. it, I thought that was kind of interesting yeah that that is kind of antiquated a little bit but yeah I know the idea of softer impact yeah that that is a good parallel I guess for as far as like what we know versus what we don't sure and of course there's the the uh, the atlantean side of it too in a way like you've said like we like, originated from the oceans like that's kind of what i've been playing with in my head too is like this idea of coming from within or from the outside like we originated from the oceans like could this have been could this be something that is terrestrial originating like you know what i mean like this phenomena these vehicles or entities or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them or is it like ivan's kind of suggesting here yeah. like some sort of extraterrestrial origin i mean this is where i obviously everyone listening can probably tell what we want it to be <laughs> i i even have a reference here I, I i had to mention like you know the idea of even like a yanaguni like could some could ancient mega structures have potentially been associated with vastly more ancient civilizations than we knew and possibly even something associated with being underwater yeah you know what i'm saying like usos and underwater civilizations from a prehistory mm-hmm. and uh and, yeah. and and perhaps atlantis is linked in there as well yeah exactly like yeah it does bring to mind some sort of atlantean water-based society and again right. i'm thinking of the imagery that's evoked by things like aquaman and stuff you know what i mean yes. where it's like yeah. highly high technology and uh very beyond civilized you know what i mean like far sub- surpassing our sort of known civilization right but that's interesting you bring up yanaguni right because we do have this example from malibu and that is another structure that is under the surface of the ocean and like yanaguni some people think this (laughs) might be either man-made or or extraterrestrial in nature sure so this what's known as the malibu structure it's located off the coast of california and it's about two thousand feet under the surface of the water So basically what it looks like, it's unusual. It's got like a flat top that has sort of an ovally triangular shape. It sort of looks like a roof. It does. It does have two very prominent vertical shafts that kind of descend downward towards another ledge feature that basically kind of reminds you of like a aircraft hangar slash a villain's lair. Oh, definitely. Like just, just like almost like a a model of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's very strange and... Yeah, like if you look this up on, well, there are images that have since been sure. like shared on the internet, um, obtained from Google Earth, and it looks like there's like maybe an entrance into a darker inner place too, but that's highly suggestive. <laughs> yeah. So it's an anomaly is what we'll call it, and it's almost three miles wide, so it's very like... You know, it's not small. No, it's a large, large structure. There's nothing really that points to it being something that is uh, nothing other than a geologic feature. Yeah. But it's an interesting place to start. And I thought this was interesting. This was a quote from an earthquake geologist of the U.S. Geological Survey. And he said, quote, there's no flag under the water that says, I'm the entrance to an alien base. (laughs) There's nothing unnatural looking about it. It's Hmm. just showing some sort of variation in the offshore coastal morphology. Yeah. So very similar to Yanaguni, right? Some people make that argument. And he actually said here, he went on to say that it could have obviously formed more of the feature when it was actually above the surface or at the coastline Uh, when the actual world's oceans were a little bit lower much like yanaguni once again exactly Yeah. yeah 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 so very similar but again right this has been basically proven to be like not a hoax but just like it, it's not, one of those funny things because it's like because of the, alien yeah person. it's like the advent of the internet right and Google Earth and like yeah. all these internet sleuths finding these different strange yeah. structures and anomalies well, and like it's like shows on TV about it exactly too. yeah no kidding like what on earth based yeah. entirely off of that mm-hmm. so it is I like how you phrased that like it is a jumping off point for the 
the discussion and the question of if there is some sort of a even if it's even if it's human even if it's a clandestine unknown like multi trillion dollar like naval naval base underwater what would it actually look like like if we were to discover stumble upon something and be like holy shit this is like an alien base of some kind what would it actually look like and that's what people were thinking when they saw this on Google Earth it's very convincing at first glance but right. again right you kind of like look at it and you're just like well it's just kind of looks it just looks like whatever because yeah. what would the precedent be for it to it be in there would mm. it be just a nice spot people like the the aliens like the california coast they want to live off malibu are they actually like viewing something that has something to do with the u.s military like mm -hmm. it does, there's no re there's no reason for it it Whereas, seems almost too convenient too close to human that's what i'm that's kind of what i'm saying it's like this was found by people on the internet yeah. i think i think they would do a little better job of staying mm. hidden yeah, and it is weird, too, because, like, a lot of people look at it and they think it's, like, oh, this is, like, right on the coast. But apparently it is, like, you know, it's submerged to quite a, like, large depth, like 2,000 feet. Like, that's not yeah. nothing. No. I don't know. It's, so, yeah, <laughs> but it, it is definitely not. A, it's not an alien base <laughs> is what we're saying to you guys. We are not We are not, <laughs> not telling, suggesting yeah. that. But, <laughs> but that, wa that was a conspiracy theory for a while and definitely still some people that, that believe that. So it just isn't going to, like, a marker, like, people – in that location, think that that's a possibility. I have another reference from a UFO group based out of Mexico that uh, is a little bit nuts, but they have some very fun ideas and, again, believe that there is some sort of extraterrestrial base, whether or not it's interdimensional or just straight up like underwater civilization, located off the coast of Mexico. Not a natural formation, and they... Anyway, let, let me get into this. Because in 1957, there were a series of hurricanes just before this and then a bunch of people from the areas of Tampico and uh Madero mm -hmm. actually I don't know exactly where those are located I should have pulled that up on the map we can do that afterwards but they claim to have seen a fleet of UFOs crossing the sky from southwest to northeast hmm. and then and then disappearing out of sight offshore and descending into the water where they believed lies some sort of an underwater alien base these individuals claim that they believe these entities do live out there and that they're benevolent aliens essentially protecting them from destruction. Hmm. So again, we could sort of loosely tie this to the idea maybe of like fault of, of like um, tectonic activity and like comings and goings from places where things are like violent, like earth activity is happening. Obviously a hurricane isn't the same thing. No, but these, yeah. but these people believe that the, uh, these aliens are preventing further hurricane destruction. And, in 2012, mm -hmm. I believe it was, the um, the leader of a local UFO gro group called the Association of Scientific UFO Research of uh, Tamulipas mm -hmm. claimed that he actually visited the base. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is where we go woo-woo with this story mm -hmm. uh, beyond what I've already <laughs> said because he comes yeah. back and he claims that he was told that this base is actually called Amupak. And he was able to visit their by astral projection that okay. was uh, was facilitated by these entities. Hmm. Okay. okay. Interesting. So, hmm. a little bit crazy. Astral projection for everyone out there. Like, I'm not. We're not getting deep into that. But it's essentially like the idea of a spirit body and a physical body. So he was able to visit it via his, yeah. his spiritual body. Yeah, like an out of body. Kind an of out of thing. body kind mm -hmm. of experience. Which, if we want to draw some lines to to connect this to the UFO phenomena it's like that sounds a lot like abduction phenomena out yeah. of body experiences right lost time these types of things so it's mm -hmm. like and, and before we started recording you were making mentions of things almost like light beans and stuff like mm -hmm. that i mean we're again we've talked about these strange balls that can split into two objects that may or may not be sentient yeah it's almost describing something along this line perhaps maybe it isn't as crazy as we think so this guy comes back claims he's visited this underwater base off the coast of mexico and that the aliens uh basically said that yeah we are going to keep protecting you <laughs> from hurricanes <laughs> and obviously this sounds a bit nuts but here we are yet again another location where there's ufo groups that believe that this base exists you know that's pretty interesting another yeah. location that we're not going to discuss today is the solomon islands where there's tons of uso sightings coming and going from the waters around the islands there maybe they're picking up the giants and dropping them off i'm not <laughs> sure and people have claimed well, to experience this so it's like 
kind of crazy, but that was my base story from off the coast of Mexico. And it's yeah. like, well, I guess we got to hire a sub and go find it, everybody. I guess so. Hey, I wonder if this guy has any coordinates that would help us. That is interesting, though, the idea of astral projection as, as the mode to get there. Because, again, I do come back to the idea of whether this is something that, yeah, is a little bit uh, more ephemeral, obviously, than mm. just strictly like a biological thing. Yeah. But... Kind of reminds me of what Edgar Casey was talking about with those, like, you know, those, uh, before we had descended into our, like, material forms, like the light beings and, like, the, it was almost like a, a more enlightened form of consciousness. And that, and then we've degraded over, you know, the right. millennia mm -hmm. and become what we are today. But it does remind me of that, like, the idea of, of light beings like they're not vehicles but they are the entities themselves right it's That's, very woo woo it's yeah. very interesting though but it also sort of like the actual encounters and sightings kind of like lend to that like ev evidence towards that like a lot of these it's like it's not nuts and bolts craft mm -hmm. like yeah some of it's we it's see silvery. silvery things are underwater it's like hey that's got to be a vehicle because it's going uh, way too fast but does silvery but, imply actual metallic or does silvery imply like shiny like a light like you know how the glow or like a fish or like a fish but <laughs> what do you mean like the <laughs> like the silver scales? swimmers like silvery yeah actually that's that's an interesting point to make but could you because like i'm thinking like daytime versus nighttime a mm. glowing might seem like you know like like a silvery thing as opposed to a glow but right. in the evening and in the dawn time you know like in the twilight hours it would yeah. appear differently yeah. perhaps i don't know okay <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> it's way out there of course this is all all of this is way out there so like just again to re just to recap here this is what we're working with as far as final theories you guys okay. and we want to hear not so final but fi final for today I guess well final <laughs> yeah no final for today that's thank you yes glad you said that final for today because I have I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to be coming back to this yep. to talk about some uh, some more locations of bases but what we're dealing with here are here's here are our options biological phenomena like amber has said ufo as entities in and of themselves these are some sort of a strange thing and then there's a million rabbit holes we can go down with that amber made a comparison of the things breaking apart almost seeming as if it's like us looking under a microscope but we're seeing it on a macro level that's a fascinating it's almost like we're in a petri dish and there's some mm. other things going on and we're just like unaware of it that reminds me of like oddball oz's episode of like we're just what was that episode he did recently where it was like, oh, we yeah. are not in a simulation, but we're like basically in like a fishbowl, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like we're like, yeah. One, one biology experiment of an totally. alien or something. Or and that was a knows. good, uh, good episode. Go check out the oddball Aussie podcast on straightupstrange.com. But the next one is like portals or yeah. entrance points. Mm -hmm. um, Entrances and, and exits of the end. Right. That. And does the fault or do uh, the ring of fire. Lines. Yeah. Does mm -hmm. that tie into it? Are these bases from far off extraterrestrials? from far off lands in terms of interdimensionally or, or literally physically coming from far away. They don't want to travel all the time. They need to monitor what we're doing. So they set up shop on the ocean floor. That's an option. This one's probably my favorite. Divergent human-like civilizations. I'm talking the abyss here, people. Mm. Or hollow earth or some sort of like intelligent entities that are Maybe. very good at remaining hidden and that live in the depths. And perhaps our ancestors, if you want to be really anthropocentric. Right. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? What if we... <laughs> diverged like a millennia and millennia ago yeah and we've gone down this route on, as terrestrial beings and yes. they've gone through a completely different transformation and yeah. evolution and all that that's really mm. fascinating and i'm me. sure most of you have seen that movie the abyss amber actually we didn't really love it maybe oh, we'll cover God. it maybe we'll <laughs> it was maybe so we'll cover bad. it though it was like no but the concepts are cool but it was just like there was a lot of subplots that were terrible it's a 90s movie right or eight, 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 late 80s All or marriage whatever. references yeah just, you oh, know the things. classic you know family dynamic sure uh, or is there something guarding something was the last thing i added here because the only reference mm. to the actual like entities like something that would be maybe driving one of these things that we can reference is the silver swimmers of Lake Baikal, where we had the dive mission, the Russian divers that encountered not objects, but what seemed to be biological entities. Were they living in the depths of the lake coming up from a sub like from the because it's a rift lake extremely mm -hmm. deep or were they wearing suits? Were they were they entities in like suits that were able to allow them to move mm -hmm. like that? And that would be, again, getting into some sort of a craft 
that people encounter and witness at Lake Baikal. We could have focused just on Baikal if we wanted to. Mm-hmm. There's so many USO sightings, lights going underneath fishing vessels yeah. and, and, and coming and out coming of the water as well. Up, up, out of the air and yeah, across the mountains and then yeah, descending into the depths. Right. Yeah, it's it's so bizarre. I just like, mm, I just want to know, man. I love all of it because it's like, to me, there's something about underwater that is even more fascinating than space to me so spooky. because it's right here. Mm-hmm. It's like more, it's more accessible. I'm air quoting, but it really isn't in so many ways. Cause it's so, mm-hmm. I know. Right. It's yeah, it is very fascinating. And even like, if you think about it even more generally, like, again, we did kind of just touch on the, just the UFO water connection. You brought up Maury Island, but there was another couple of examples. And I believe one of them was, around i think it was melbourne or something or it could be sydney maybe i think it was australian and it was again it was totally different but it was the idea of ufos uh taking up water like they 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 position themselves over water and then you could see them almost like uptaking like it's almost like some kind of fuel maybe they're using hydrogen in some way right i don't know but yeah i know that there's so many different aspects of the connection between UFOs, USOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, yeah. and water. Yeah. And it's, I think, I don't know if this is just because we have such a intimate connection to water too and are so reliant on it for our right. survival, mm-hmm. but it seems like there is some sort of parallel though, perhaps. And I made yeah. the joke to you. I was like, well, we're like 70% water. So maybe that's why aliens make, find it so interesting. <laughs> like, uh, hey, I don't know. Actually, like, hey, that's... <laughs> they're harvesting us as like fuel cells. <laughs> hey, that kind of uh, makes sense. I have so many wild ideas. <laughs> that's like the matrix. I need to start writing some of these down. <laughs> yeah, you should start writing some of these down. Okay, everybody. So we've, we've listed out some of those uh, rabbit holes that we could continue to go down in a f- part two of this. And I think that might be coming. We definitely want to hear what you guys have to say. And I think we need to go searching for some other locations, even though I definitely have an inclination of a few that we want to bring to you guys. And also some stories of people claiming to actually go to these places um, with some more details mm-hmm. than uh, than the gentleman from the uh, UFO group based out of Mexico. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. But uh, hit us up with your thoughts. Send us yeah. an email into the portal mailbox at gmail.com. Come follow us on Instagram at Into the Portal Podcast, on Twitter at Into the Portal One, and come follow the network as well at Strange Pods on Instagram and Strange Podcasts on Twitter. Also, we have a brand new show, brand new show from the network uh, called The Mastorians Podcast. I am one of the co-hosts uh, joined by Nikolaus Cox, who uh, you guys have uh, got to listen to on a few of our recent episodes, archaeologist, adventurer, artist. So uh, that's going to be super fun. We have our first episode up on the uh, mythical kingdom of Prester John. So So it's going to be a lot more history and archaeology focused. So you can get your uh, your your crazy paranormal on in, into the portal, and then a little bit uh, extra history if you're if you're Jones and for it on the Mastorians podcast. So as always, do you have any final thoughts here, Amber? I am just excited to know what everyone's favorite theories are, what their ideas are, and I want to get some more stories out of the woodwork of oh, different yeah. accounts and what you guys uh, have p- managed to pull together. So yeah, I, as always, this is just a ton of loose ends all unraveled <laughs> all over the place you know it's just yeah. like that old scarf that's falling apart but <laughs> it's true but it's, it's so true. fun to kind of just follow all these different trails so yeah i don't know yeah hit us up just let us know what you guys think and if you want us to go and do a second part and if you guys oh yeah this was yeah. a good jumping off point i have a feeling we'll be coming back to it i have a feeling too yeah well thank you guys all so much for listening to into the portal if you're enjoying listening to the show make sure to leave us a rating and review on itunes and apple Podcasts. that helps yeah. everyone find find us or even come join the crew over in our patreon community absolutely we've got so many wonderful people over there and uh, of course always big thank you to our producers we've got adam we've got stanley and we've got nightwing Anyways, yeah really no, enjoying that thank you so much and to <laughs> so, everyone on patreon for sure exactly and a quick announcement too i guess we're dummies and we uh <laughs> Didn't think of this before, but we're going to be doing ad-free releases of all of our regular feed episodes on our Patreon. So yeah. if you don't like listening to ads, which, you know, some people like to just skip past them. Some people like to listen to them. It's mm-hmm. relevant for some people. But if you don't and you want to support us, 
every tier, starting a dollar, yeah. you can get ad-free episodes from yeah. Into the Portal yeah. starting with this release. Starting with this release, <laughs> which is going to be awesome. Yeah, we're dummies. We should have done that a long time but ago. But I'm really excited just to have that as a new offering. So Absolutely. Yeah. Simple, right? Simple. <laughs> the little things. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, brace yourselves for the next episode and prepare to head back beneath the waves. But uh, until next time, thank you so much for listening to Into the Portal. Your gateway to the bizarre. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com. We can sum up McDonald's new crispy chicken sandwich in one word. Crispy, but also juicy and tender. Okay, it's crispy, juicy, tender, all one word. But then... Also pickle. Oh, and potato bun, which is two words. Okay, we can't sum up our new crispy chicken sandwich in one word, so you'll just have to try it to understand it. Order ahead on the McDonald's app at participating McDonald's. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.